I'm here. Meet me at the same location. While this may seem like the plot from a science fiction film, it's actually what occurs at our ports of entry every day. Every day our local animal and plant life is being threatened by what both returning traveling natives and tourists bring into our ports, whether intentionally or accidentally. Invasive alien species are any kind of organism, animal, plants, parasites, even microorganisms that come from the outside, that's the alien in the term and that cause damage, that's the invasive in the term. So basically it is some organism that is brought in accidentally or deliberately and then because it doesn't have any natural enemies, any predators or diseases here in St. Lucia, it expands and causes damage by competition, predation and so forth, pushing other organisms to the margins, even to extinction. St. Lucia has some beautiful and unique flora and fauna. But this rich biodiversity can easily disappear if the threat of invasive alien species is not managed carefully. Some invasive alien species may appear quite innocent and even beautiful. But if they threaten the rich biodiversity of the island and jeopardize the food security and health of the island, they must be controlled, contained, or even eradicated. In the 1980s, the Forestry Department launched a vigorous campaign to save the St. Lucian parrot, the Amazona versicella, from extinction, especially due to illegal hunting and reduction of their natural habitat due to farming. However, these gains can be quickly undone by its simple little relative, the orange-winged parrot. The orange wing parrot is one of our more recent exotic introductions. Um, a few years ago, some persons um, who wanted such a parrot as a pet brought, brought a few of them in, and a few of them have, have escaped into our natural habitat. If the numbers of these orange wing parrots in the wild become sufficiently high, they could ad adversely affect our St. Lucia parrot by competing with them for nesting sites and for, for food. Also, because the, the diet of these birds, these orange wing parrots, is more diverse than our, our local part, they could um, also affect our agricultural uh, industry. Now, as recently as the 1970s, there were only 100 to uh, about 150 of our local parts in the wild. Uh, through an intense conservation effort, um, our numbers are now over 1,500. Since our local St. Lucia parrot is only just rebounding from the brink of extinction, we like to control any perceived threats. A somewhat similar case to the St. Lucian parrot's precarious situation is that of the very unique and endangered St. Lucian iguana population. This large lizard is believed to have been at one time so plentiful it prompted the Arawak name for the island, Ayanola, the land where iguanas are found. This is no longer the case. Now with a global population of possibly in the hundreds and located nowhere else but on the northeast coast of St. Lucia, the St. Lucian iguana finds itself under extreme pressure to survive. Threats to the survival of the St. Lucian iguana includes loss of its natural habitat through sand mining and clearance of dry forest, being hunted for its meat by humans and by alien predators such as stray cats and dogs, mongooses and feral pigs. But there is a new threat to our unique endemic iguana. Somewhere around 2008, uh, people from the Sufra area, you know, called the forestry department and reported that they were seeing iguanas in the Sufra area, like around the steel um, in the Turai area. So when we responded, we noticed that they were not our native, you know, uh, green iguanas. 
but these iguanas are also green iguanas and they're not completely separated you know from our native green iguanas but there are some unique you know differences between the two these iguanas you know were being kept somewhere in Sufre and they might have been deliberately released or they escaped and by by 2008 it seemed like you know they had already started you know reproducing we have a potential problem on our hands the department's response you know was to put a team of, of persons on the field to search for those iguanas and to see if we could capture and eradicate them well today we're doing some radio tracking um, there's an iguana somewhere in this, this um, area. It's about um, four or five weeks ago, we placed a radio caller, a transmitter, around its um, waste area. And um, today we'll be trying to track this iguana so we can have a visual um, idea of its present location. I'm getting a strong reading up there. That direction. Now many people like to know why we are so um, keen on capturing and removing these alien iguanas. The fact is that our local iguana population in the northeast coast could suffer from these alien, this alien introduction. Yeah. Strong reading. If these iguanas get to cross the island and cross breed with our local iguana, our local iguana will lose its genetic value. So that's one major concern we have. In other countries where these iguanas have been invaded, they have been, become quite numerous and they are known to affect people's um, garden plants, uh, ag the agricultural sector can also suffer. In Puerto Rico, they even have a problem at the airport where um, the iguanas are so numerous that they, they can prevent planes from taking off and landing at the time they're supposed to. In fact, Puerto Rico spends about 80,000 US dollars a year eradicating these iguanas just from the airport area. You see it? Yeah. Hey, there you go. Yeah. All right. Many invasive animal species are introduced to the island through the exotic pet trade. Individuals, either legally or illegally, bring pets exotic to the island and these pets sometimes escape captivity or are released by uninformed pet owners into the environs. The alien species then upset the natural ecological balance established over generations and most times aggressively outcompete rare endemic species mainly due to the fact that in their newly occupied territory there are no natural predators to keep populations in check. As a forest officer we frequently get uh, requests to, from persons coming in from overseas. They might be returning nationals or they might be uh, visitors who are interested in bringing along some exotic pet that uh, they've had for years in whichever country. Now, San Lucia is a party to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, abbreviation in, is CITES as it's more commonly known. And from a, a trade standpoint, you know, you look at whether the species is endangered. However, beyond CITES, then there's the issue of quarantine. And that's where the, the veterinary department would be, pay attention to disease issues. But we're realizing that beyond that, we'd have to be concerned about the potential risk of a species becoming invasive. If we now have that concern that introducing certain reptiles to St. Lucia could become invasive, as indeed in the case of the iguana, the green iguana, that's become a problem in Sufre, we have to go a step beyond. The issue of invasive alien species is also important, so a species must meet all levels of criteria, not only whether it's endangered, not only whether it's relevant to trade, but also that potential risk of it becoming invasive. And that goes for both plants and animals. The effect of the exotic pet trade on local fauna is mirrored by the ornamental plant trade on local flora. Ornamental plants are terrestrial or aquatic plants grown and used for decorative purposes in homes, gardens or landscape designs, including cut flowers, dried plant parts and potpourri and aquarium species. The water hyacinth is a beautiful aquatic plant from South America 
that has turned invasive in many countries where it was introduced as ornamental. The plant now threatens to clog up freshwater dams on island while providing ideal breeding grounds for mosquitoes, posing a potential health risk to many. Ill-advised individuals smuggle seeds or cuttings into the country without consulting the experts. Even if plant seeds or cuttings are intended only for the owner's home garden, these introductions can be the source of devastating invasions by the plant as well as its pests and pathogens, which the layperson cannot detect. One example is the pink hibiscus mealybug, which I'm sure every St. Lucian has heard about. It was brought in by accident as a plant pest on hibiscus, an ornamental plant. So that already illustrates one of the pathways how invasive species come into our country. As little hitchhikers on other commodities, in that case ornamental plants, ornamental plants are a big problem in terms of invasive species. Now this little pest doesn't have any natural predators here. The birds and the other insects that prey on small insects do not eat and do not know the pink hibiscus mealybug. So that's why it exploded into a massive pest when it was first introduced. And it doesn't attack only hibiscus, it attacks many other plant species and that was a big problem. A team of international scientists went to the Asian origin of the pink mealybug to look for its natural enemies. This process is very expensive, but the affected islands shared the cost and it bore results. We had a success story in the pink mealybug, which was introduced in the 1990s and we had to find a way of controlling it. Chemical control was not effective and we had to introduce a parasitoid which was a wasp and a predator which was, which was a cryptolimus beetle that fed on the pink mealybug and it was successful. The pink hibiscus mealybug has never been eradicated but it is now in balance with nature and it is now a minor pest that might flare up for a short while, but it will subside again. It is under control and permanently. Once the released organism has established, there's no need to do anything else. Many plant cuttings carry with them accompanying pathogens. And this is the reason when traveling, one of the travel documents we were asked to fill out includes a declaration of plant material. Plants and flowers are listed as prohibited items when entering a port in St. Lucia. Even craft items made of untreated plant material may carry undetected pests. The red palm mite is an invasive species originating in Asia that seriously harms the coconut trees and the associated industry. It's believed to have reached the Caribbean through shipping routes and then spread through the islands by the tourist souvenir trade in coconut leaf products. Other invasive alien species may be introduced to the island as hitchhikers on imported agricultural or construction materials. The now common annoying sandflies were introduced to the island through a shipment of sand. The anoli lizard and new species of beetles also came to the island hidden in lumber shipments. Officers at the ports of entries, while unable to prevent every accidental hitchhiker from entering the island, work assiduously to reduce the possibilities of such invasion by making sure strict guidelines regarding importation are followed. In order for lumber to enter St. Lucia, the importers have to apply for an import permit from the Ministry of Agriculture and on this permit will be stated the requirements and conditions under which the lumber is allowed to enter. The shipping agent, however, would inform us when they have lumber vessels coming in two days prior to the arrival into St. Lucia. When the vessel is here, before anybody can go on board, the quarantine officer along with customs and the shipping agent will board the vessel. The quarantine officer will then be taken into the hold of the ship where examination is carried out on the consignment. If the consignment is found to be free of any pests, the lumber is released. If there is an incident of pest, the lumber will either be Communicated or reshipped to the country of origin. Sometimes invasive alien species reach our shores for the strangest of reasons. The giant African land snail, for example, was believed to be smuggled into St. Lucia from Martinique to be bred for French visitors to eat. Dubbed one of the most damaging snails in the world because it consumes at least 500 different types of plants, this huge mollusk 
quickly became a pest through large areas of the island. The giant African snail originated in East Africa. It spread into the Pacific in, the 1940, in around 1946 and it has arrived in our region. Years ago it used to be in Martinique and finally it, it reached our shores around June 2000. When it first came in, we saw it in a location of Moshi and it has spread from that area in many different areas of this country. This snail is especially destructive and difficult to control because it can cause structural damage to plaster and stucco and can live as long as nine years with adults laying about 1,200 eggs in a typical year. The giant African snail, once it is, is introduced in, a, in an area or in a country, it is very difficult to control. And when you, to control the giant African snail, you must, you must use many different methods of control. You can use physical methods, for example, if you have a garden in your backyard, cleaning the area and putting a band of sand around the crops, it will slow down the activity of the snail. It doesn't like to cross the sand to, to affect your crops. You must also use um, chemical control and metal di slug bait. It, 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 it kills them very well. If you have um, organic matter in your yard, for example, mulch and so on, they like to hide under the mulch. You also have to get rid of the mulch. Also, you can, the snails can be collected not with your hands, with gloves, and they could pl be placed in a bucket with water and covered because since they are not aquatic snails, they will drown. Although the snail is a slow-moving mollusk, it spreads quickly through ingenious methods. The, the snail is very easy to spread and one of the ways the snail spreads is on, on your vehicles. If your vehicle is packed in an area of high infestation, you find that the snail can, can climb on the vehicle and, and you travel somewhere else and the snail can go to a new area. The snail also can, in nursery material, in plant material, if you have somebody who has a nursery and you, you are transporting um, plants and, and soil from one area to the next, you can transport the adults, you can also transport the eggs from one, from one area to the next. The, the, the giant African snail, being, a, being an invasive species, created many problems for us and we had to find ways of controlling it. As I, as I mentioned earlier on, we, we have to use many different methods, physical methods, cultural practices, and also chemical, chemical methods to bring that giant African snail under control. Another invasive species gaining much notoriety in recent times is the Indo-Pacific lionfish. This fish, although beautiful in appearance, has venomous spines and is known to have a voracious appetite for small fishes, therefore jeopardizing the local fish industry. The lionfish originally is from the Indo-Pacific region, so that's areas near China, Fiji, Australia. Now the lionfish is prized for the aquarium trade, so a lot of, a lot of the times people would travel to those countries buy the lionfish and travel back to the US to have them in the aquariums. The lionfish was then caught and placed in an aquarium in Florida. In 1992, after Hurricane um, Andrew, the lionfish got released into the Atlantic Ocean. And from then on, it began to spread throughout the Caribbean, even as far north as Maine in Canada. In October 2011, Senusha reported its first sighting of lionfish. Lionfish have voracious appetites. Researchers have counted up to 20 fishes in the stomach of one lionfish. They feed on popular native species such as snapper, parrotfish, and crustaceans such as lobster, and their numbers are increasing rapidly. The lionfish also has no natural predators in the water, which means that the lionfish could feed on our native species and there's no other fish that can eat the lionfish. And because the lionfish, after one year, when it reaches sexual maturity, it is known to breed every four days or reproduce every four days and it releases as much as two million eggs every four days. So the lionfish could outcompete our native species. Fishes of the lionfish must always be aware of the fish's venomous spines. The lionfish is also known to have venomous spines on certain fins about its body. And if one is not aware of those fins and not handled properly, the lionfish can inflict some pain through a sting. Um, persons are encouraged that they should handle a lionfish with care so as to avoid getting stung by a lionfish. 
There are also protective gloves that you could wear that could help protect you from uh, the sting of the lionfish. But once those spines are removed, the lionfish can be eaten like any other fish. Because it's known to feed on a lot of the snapper fish, a lot of the reef fish, you could appreciate that when tourists come down to St. Lucia, they come to experience a diversity of fish. So once you have a species like the lionfish feeding on our native species, you will more or less have a reduction in the diversity of native species. So the lionfish may have the potential to impact the tourism product because of the potential reduction of fish species and its diversity. So now we know about invasive alien species and the threats they pose, what can we do about them? The most cost-effective method is prevention, obviously, like in many cases. So what we really try to do is avoid the invasive species coming in. Once we have something come in by accident or by illegal action by somebody, maybe smuggling it or unknowingly, unwittingly, hitchhiker coming in, the most important thing is early detection and rapid response before that organism can establish. That is the second step in the cascade, early detection and rapid response. And for that, we depend a lot on the solution public because it might be the customer officer spotting it, but very often it is a farmer or a resident who sees that something unusual pops up. And then we really like these people to give us a call. There's a couple of hotlines established, say for lionfish or for the iguana and sufra. So we know and we can react as quickly as we possibly can. Okay, okay. 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 Okay, we also encourage the, the public and various stakeholders that if they're out there diving or fishing or just having fun on the beach that if they do sight a lionfish that they report it to the Department of Fisheries or you could report it to the Sufra Marine Management Authority or the dive sector or the, if you're diving with a, a, a dive shop or a hotel you could report it to your dive instructor. So that, that could help inform us as to where the lionfish is found and how it's growing or how the population is doing in terms of sightings. If we fail to respond quickly and the organism establishes, it is very difficult to eradicate it. Eradication means comp getting completely rid of it. It becomes too expensive and at that point, once it has reached that point beyond eradication, the effect is pretty irreversible. We have to learn to live with it and have to control it, keep the population at a certain level that minimizes damage, contain the organism maybe in a certain area that it doesn't spread to the most vulnerable habitats. We have that example, for instance, on the offshore islands like Maria Island. They have never had any infestation by rats. Also mongooses, feral cats and dogs are a problem. But because they've never reached, we still have the whiptail lizard and the St. Lucian racer and the pygmy and all these endemic species there. In fact, St. Lucia's offshore islands serve as the last remaining habitats for some rare species of animals. One being the St. Lucia racer. The St. Lucia racer is a completely harmless snake. It's a very gentle animal. It lets you pick it up. It doesn't struggle or try and bite you. But it's also, we believe, possibly the rarest snake in the world. It's only found on a single site, one offshore island, Maria Major, which is 12 hectares. And that's the entire world's population of this species. It was declared extinct in 1935 until one individual was captured on Maria Island's nature reserve in 1973 by two local naturalists, Gregor Williams and Robert DeVoe. Well, at the end of 2011, the beginning of 2012, we did a survey of Maria Island to try and get some idea of how many racer snakes were there. We were able to get an estimate which could be as high as 100, could be as low as 18 individuals. 
We believe the St Lucia racer is so rare because of the mongoose on St Lucia, which was introduced towards the end of the 19th century. There was a scientific paper written in St Lucia before the mongoose was introduced, and at that time the racer was the second commonest snake on St Lucia, about 60 years after the mongoose had been introduced here. Um, it was believed to be extinct and it's a very striking and quite sad example of how invasive species can have a huge impact on native species on an island like St Lucia. The only hope for the survival of this endangered endemic species is to protect its last remaining habitat in the world from invasive alien species predators. Here we have one of our primary systems for monitoring and monitoring invasions of rats. It's called a uh, just basically a rat bait station. Um, it's one of many that we have dotted along the, 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 the coastline of, of Maria Major and Maria Minor to prevent invasions of rats. And so what we normally do is that we, every five to six weeks, we return and we rebait these stations and check if these baits have been, this bait has been eaten by rats. You can tell whether or not they have been eaten by rats with the rat teeth bites along here so this one's just been eaten by ants. Although these baiting systems are only used for rats, our monitoring system for mongoose is in place where we determine whether or not a mongoose has been in, has invaded an island by checking for any dead birds or any dead reptiles on the island. Maria Major is also home to other rare species found only in St Lucia such as the Maria Islands pygmy gecko and St Lucia whiptail lizard further emphasizing the need to keep these islands free from invasive alien predators. Increase in the infamous four T's, human trade, tourism, transport and travel over the years has dramatically enhanced the spread of invasive species, allowing them to surmount natural geographic barriers. So we look at um, the significant areas for um, introduction of species, trade, transport, and the tourism sector. And we've tried to address each of these sectors and the needs um, through a consultative process with partners and stakeholders. We know we have partners in the private sector who would be importers. Individuals involved in the ornamental plant and horticultural trade must go through the official channels where a risk assessment will be carried out and obtain import permits before introducing any new species or cultivar to St. Lucia. Where pet owners are concerned, four points must be strictly adhered to. 1. Never release pets. 2. Prevent accidental escape of pets. 3. Hand unwanted pets to authorities, that is, the Wildlife Unit of the Forestry Department for Land Species and the Fisheries Department for Aquarium Species. And 4. Control your pets especially predatory pets like cats and dogs, and especially in areas of high native wildlife concern. Everything we depend upon, all life on this planet, and indeed St. Lucia, ultimately relies on sound and healthy ecosystems and the goods and services they provide. Therefore, we should be reducing the risks when it comes to securing our ecosystems. And that means also um, reducing the risk of introducing exotic species that can become invasive. You may like a certain animal or plant that you've seen or come into contact with in a foreign environment where it's controlled. It has natural predators, it has other animals, other insects that feed on it, they compete and therefore there's a balance in their ecosystem. But if you brought it in here where you don't have the natural um, controlling elements, natural factors that balance out the species existence in the local context, then you run into problems. And therefore, African giant snails, parrots, exotic parrots, um, exotic pet fish, you need to realize the potential harm it may do in our environment and therefore think twice before bringing in these things. Whether you bring them in a yacht or you fly them in your suitcase or or anything like that, think twice about it. You want a healthy and productive biodiversity in St. Lucia. Invasive alien species affect all of us, whether it's by depleting our rich biodiversity 
by competing with our rare endemic species for limited resources, or by costing our government huge sums to prevent devastation to crops and the fishing industry. Invasive alien species prevention and mitigation is everyone's business. Let's all play our part to ensure that St. Lucia's unique natural heritage is preserved for generations to come.